The world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world. Each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spy was very much part of the Cold War. And how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World. Mutually Assured Destruction. In this episode, World War II comes to an end. But the result is not world peace. Tensions soar. Territories are seized. A new weapon and new frontiers mark the start of the Cold War. The Rise of the Superpowers. Germany surrendered in May 1945, leaving Japan alone still fighting the Allies. Terrible destruction descended. There had been a distinct city below us. There was nothing down there but what, in my vernacular, was a black boiling mess. Most of the city appears to have been obliterated. Four square miles of desolation are reported. And that cloud up above it was just tumbling and rolling. You could see the energy that was in it. Hiroshima, the 6th of August, 1945. Perhaps as many as 70,000 people are instantly killed by just one single bomb. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. It was very hard-headed, including about, you know, not losing uh, uh, troops in, in Japan. So he dropped, you know, made the decision to drop the atom bomb once he knew about it. There is more to come. That's the atomic bomb exploding at Nagasaki. All of you who see this picture can judge for yourselves the extent of the menace to civilization of this new weapon. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. The bomb has been used on human beings. Twice. It was a global, world-scale war, so you know, I think there's a very strong argument that uh, the use of those weapons to end the war quick without having to address a conventional invasion of Japan, uh, very legitimate. The USA celebrates the new superweapon. They are the only nation that possesses the bomb. Something horrific has been invented, 
and it cannot be uninvented. I don't think nuclear weapons were necessary to bring a swift end to World War II. Japanese scholars are now almost unanimous in saying, no, it was not Hiroshima and Nagasaki that led us to sue for peace. It was Russia's entry into the war that same week. That was the decisive factor. The one great achievement of nuclear weapons in most people's mind, that it did save a catastrophically prolonged war on the Japanese landmass, even that disappears on closer evaluation. Will this power, now available to man, bring another, even more suicidal war upon us? Or can it be made to rule out war? and open a new progressive chapter of history, the Atomic Age. The weapons used to end the Cold War with Japan mark the beginning of a new conflict. It is a conflict where astronomical amounts of money will be spent on weapons. It will last nearly 50 years. And if it escalates, it will mark the end of human civilization. It is the Cold War. This is Movie Town rejoicing with you in victory. Three months earlier in Europe, VE Day. Victory has been won over Germany. Its evil leader, Adolf Hitler, is dead. Six years of horrendous suffering have come to a close. World War II is almost over. As the guns in Europe go silent, a meeting in the USA aims to ensure a war like the last one never happens again. San Francisco, where 50 United Nations have been working for eight weeks to produce a charter on which the future of world peace will depend. It is now my duty to call for a vote on the approval of the charter of the United Nations Dr. Wellington Koo signed first for China. Then, one by one, all the countries represented at San Francisco signed the Charter of Freedom and Peace on which the hopes of the whole world are centered. This new structure of peace is rising upon strong foundations. Let us not fail to grasp this supreme chance to establish a worldwide rule of reason to create an enduring peace under the guidance of God. The United Nations is born. 50 nations sign the charter. Russia joins the pledge for world peace. Despite fears for the future, it is a moment of great optimism. Men and women chosen to represent the vast majority of mankind in this new effort to make life safe for the ordinary citizen throughout the globe. In a disillusioned world, some may think such a task impossible. But given goodwill, it is, of course, not impossible. And the alternative is world destruction. Two turning points in history create the Cold War. The atomic bomb is one. The second threatens to start another worldwide nuclear war. Communism is based on the belief that man is so weak and inadequate that he is unable to govern himself and therefore requires the rule of strong masters. Communism, a revolutionary form of government in Russia since 1917. 
Moscow's Red Square was the spacious and impressive setting for the Red Army's first victory parade. The Cold War was actually a confrontation of two ideologies, communism versus capitalism. Simple as that. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. Well, I thought communism was, in theory, better than democracy. But unfortunately, uh, as Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst of all forms of government except for all the rest. Russia was always a doubtful partner for the Allies. Communist ideology, here is at odds with capitalism. The totalitarian state is at odds with Western democracy. Brainwashed, educated at school to uh, hate the West. The fat, big capitalists who were bent on conquering the USSR. Known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics since the revolution, Russia is ruled by Joseph Stalin, General Secretary of the Communist Party. This great leader of the proletariat, who was a genius of all times. Today, Stalin watches with pride as units of the Red Air Force fly over the Soviet capital. Stalin has big plans for communism. He's already made a move at the Allied Peace Conference just before the close of World War II. The Livadia Palace at Yalta was the scene of the conference, a sumptuous looking place which used to be occupied by the Tsar when he took a winter holiday in the Crimea. Yalta, plans are made to divide Europe between the four victorious parties, Britain, the United States, France, and the Soviet Union. Germany will be divided in four. The eastern part will be run by the USSR. Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt acknowledge that Eastern Europe, occupied by the Red Army, is Stalin's. It is crazy. And the whole partitioning of the world between the great powers, as you know, in Yalta, when they got together and they've kind of had this little piece of paper in which they scribbled, you know, 70% of Poland to you, 20% to us, and all that, you know. So, you know, we've, we've got to where we've got. I think the uh, government, because of the sickness of Roosevelt and the ascension to power of President Truman, trying to learn to deal with Stalin and Churchill, led to some belief that the Russians would treat the Eastern European better. The Polish election was a test. The Soviets pledged a free democratic election in Poland. There was wrangling and delay, and when the election was finally held, it was a totalitarian affair staged by a red dictatorship. Red Marshal Tito established a communist dictatorship in Yugoslavia. Hungarian Premier Naj, whose democratic government was overthrown by the communists, a culminating violation of Soviet pledges of democratic liberty. There was a rigged election in Hungary, which the communists rigged, or the Soviets rigged, and the communists came to power, and Hungary became part of the Soviet orbit. One after the other, Eastern European nations come under direct Soviet control. You took it for granted. Soviets have liberated Europe, and therefore, you know, we've liberated them from capitalists, from any other kind of ambiguity about who they were. Winston Churchill publicizes a name for the line dividing communist Eastern Europe from the West. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. 
Well, I think the Iron Curtain was a very big surprise, uh, a very unpleasant surprise. I think it led to the famous speech by Churchill uh, to wake up the Americans that despite all the costs and the great victory of World War II, there now seemed to be uh, some people who wanted to cause more trouble to create a, another warlike situation, and that, that country that was going to do that was the uh, Soviet Union. The United States makes an attempt to revive Europe with the Marshall Plan. This financial support project offers to include the Eastern Bloc countries as well as the USSR. Ordinary Americans get involved. The Citizens Food Committee in America had been asking for public donations of staple foodstuffs. He is giving generously, as are thousands young and old who wish to aid our friends abroad who face either untold suffering or communist control. The Friendship Train, an idea sparked by a Washington journalist that inspires generosity across the USA. Enduring its journey across the continent. Everywhere, great crowds turned out to endorse this expression of America's goodwill and practical aid for the free nations of Western Europe. In addition to milk, canned goods, and other food products, gifts of money have been collected. Stockton, California is another stop on the Friendship Route, over which the railroads are carrying the train at no cost as they're part of the gift grant. The train travels from coast to coast, collecting food, fuel, and clothes, making over 40 stops on the way. New carloads of vital supplies are coupled on at each stop, and the train is expected to arrive in New York in two sections, hauling 200 cars. The cargo, valued at about $40 million, is shipped to France and given out across Europe in support of the Marshall Plan. But Stalin refuses to allow Marshall aid in his communist world. Recriminations and refusal. Molotov quitting the conference and denouncing the Marshall Plan. The cleavage between West and East becomes an economic division. The line of the Iron Curtain now separates Western and Soviet economic spheres as the representatives of the free nations of the West go ahead without Russia. The big powers invite all Europe to join the parley. All Soviet satellites reject. You know, when we were leaving Lithuania, my parents initially thought they would do it legitimately. So they went to the Russian consulate and asked for permission to leave. And the answer they got is says, listen, nothing leaves. Even the birds are not going to fly out if we can figure out how to stop them. Barbed wire and watchtowers have closed off the east. The Soviet threat is real. The Cold War has begun. The USA believes Stalin wants to take over Europe and China. Fear of a third world war grows. President Truman decides to build more atomic bombs. The first will be tested in the Pacific Ocean on a tiny group of islands known as the Bikini Atoll. On Bikini itself, giant towers are being built for photographic observation. This will be the first atomic bomb explosion since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It is a dangerous experiment. No one knows exactly what will happen. The U.S. military is determined the details of its super weapon will remain strictly secret. The atom bomb, carefully screened, is wheeled to the B-29 that's about to carry it to Bikini. Not even a glimpse of this epoch-making missile is permitted. The bomb is named Gilda, after a Rita Hayworth movie. And now it's time to go. Mission Crossroads has begun.
Those without goggles shielded their eyes with their arms as the world's fourth atom bomb fell. Following the colossal flash, a great cloud rose seven miles up into the sky. All can judge for themselves that the world is certainly at the crossroads. The second bomb is tested two weeks later. This time, it will be 27 meters underwater. Two minutes to go. Dr. Holloway moves a switch, lights flash. The bomb is named Helen of Bikini. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. Radiation, smoke, fire, steam, water, a pattern of irresistible power recorded by a movie tone cameraman, among many others, recorded for all the world to see as thousands of tons of water swirling upward, a picture that epitomizes the colossal energy released. The U.S. and its close allies were in possession of, of a uh, weapon capability in the form of a nuclear deterrent that, that clearly had strategic implications. An air view of an explosion equal to 50,000 tons of TNT. Scientists compute the temperature in the center of the atomic typhoon as 100 million degrees. The temperatures generated will melt steel and vaporize anything living. In a polarized world, the USA has a massive military advantage. Aggression towards the West is growing behind the Iron Curtain. U.S. employees of an oil company are lucky to get out of Hungary. We were apprehended. We were taken down to this rather famous city station and uh, questioned sometimes not too pleasantly, and we spent the next week there. But nationals of the country, occupied by Stalin, are barred from leaving their country. They were not so much terrified as frustrated by, by the lack of freedoms and the lack of democracy. The jokes, and there were many, many of them, which were quite cutting and dismissive of Stalin. You know, I'll just tell you a tiny little one, you know, when there is somebody drowning and they get him out of the lake, and this person says, you can ask me for anything you want, uh, I'm Stalin. And they said, only please don't tell anybody that we've saved you. Attempts to escape are daring and sometimes bizarre. This is the homemade tank used by a Czech mechanic to escape to Bavaria. Crashing through the electrified wire after a 30-mile drive to the frontier, he took his wife and two children with him, as well as a number of others who joined in his bold and successful bid for freedom. It's a risky business nowadays, trying to escape from Soviet-held East Germany to the safety of the West, but thousands have been making the attempt. At that time, it was extremely difficult and dangerous because the borders were closed with electrified fences, landmines. It was extremely difficult to, to get out. The dramatic story of the three Czech planes that recently landed at Erding in the American zone of Germany, some 20 miles from Munich, is a story of escape to freedom. So Mr. Kowski here, who took the plane up from Prague airport and who has force landed it on the uh, airfield, uh, well, I should say on the strip outside of Prague. 
It uh, took about 90 seconds before all of us were embarked and uh, immediately uh, we took off. About 20 minutes later, we have crossed the border into the uh, American territory. Some of the refugees from communism are more than they seem. In Newark, New Jersey, there's a radio factory worker who's escaped from behind the real Iron Curtain. He's Jonas Chernius, once Premier of Lithuania, who got away with his family when his country was taken over by Soviet Russia. How do you feel about it all, Mr. Chernius? I am feeling very well. I am free. I have found very good friends and relatives. I have to eat. Them. I am not more hungry. I am very happy. People in the West are both scared and intrigued by the closed world behind the Iron Curtain. Reports reveal Soviet-controlled countries are training their young people for war. Information is hard to get, but life in the East seems austere. The ancient city of Belgrade, modern Yugoslavia's capital, presents a picture of particular interest, for it offers a glimpse of a country in Eastern Europe, which is today a focus of curiosity for Western eyes. From the peasants who come here to do their shopping, one gets an impression of sturdy types, some recalling the days when Serbia was a separate kingdom. In Berlin, the Brandenburg Gate marks the boundary between East and West, but filming beyond the Iron Curtain was recently permitted. The once famous Unterden Linden now has a very new look, and our cameraman made these notes of the kind of shops and stores they've got. Street names, of course, have changed since Stalin and his comrades took over this part of the former German capital. The Soviets occupied Eastern Europe uh, purportedly to help them, and then they were going to withdraw, and they weren't going to leave large troops stationed there. Turns out that they did, and as a result, in 1947, uh, the Soviets were not going to leave Eastern Europe and let those people have their own country. Getting stories is risky for Western journalists. Many are arrested for their efforts. Freed after more than two years in a red jail, Mr. Otis was reunited with his wife on arrival at Idlewild Airport, New York. It said that it was largely due to her personal appeal that the Czech government finally agreed to liberate him. Bill, do you yep, feel that the Czechs had any justification at all in arresting you? That's pretty tough, too. That's oh, complicated, okay, too. Did, did you feel and, uh, I'll tell you what. From their point of view, in certain respects, they had. They did have? Yes, that's true. Uh, could you explain? The standards are different there. They look at things in a different way. Most people in the West are disturbed about the growing oppression in the East. If the Soviet Union really wants peace, it can prove it by lifting the Iron Curtain and permitting the free exchange of information and ideas. The Summer Olympics in Helsinki are rocked by the Cold War. This event, designed to bring nations together, is also ripped apart. Helsinki, Finland's capital, is certainly a fine-looking town, and it was all ready for the Games when we took these views near the Olympic Stadium with the swimming pool in the background. The Eastern Bloc athletes are kept separate from their Western rivals. Some 10 miles away is the so-called Iron Curtain Village, where teams from Russia and satellite nations are housed. Here's the camp manager with some Hungarian girl athletes. Everywhere, of course, Iron Curtain signs are in evidence. The world realizes that the Cold War frontiers are here for the long term. Not everyone in the West is against communism. Guerrillas in Southern Europe seek a communist takeover. They are funded by the USSR. In Greece, a more dangerous crisis. Civil war developed. Greek government troops trying to suppress red guerrilla bands aided by Soviet satellite countries, Yugoslavia, Albania, Bulgaria. The 
Greek government states that these gangs have been sponsored and trained mostly by Yugoslavia, that their object is terrorism and loot, and that there are well-known criminals among them. The very existence of the Greek state is today threatened by the terrorist activities of several thousand armed men led by communists. The Security Council hears the case of Greece. Mr. Saudaris, the Premier, charges Yugoslavia, Bulgaria and Albania with inciting a leftist rebellion. The United States has received from the Greek government an urgent appeal for financial and economic assistance. Greece must have assistance if it is to become a self-supporting and self-respecting democracy. The United States did not particularly want to get back involved in war or back involved in, in the European uh, nation's business was forced to do so because of the recognition that without the help from the big country uh, here that uh, the Greeks would go under and communism would spread even further. The USA pours in money, arms and advisors to stop the spread of communism. Fighting in Greece has gone on pretty continuously ever since World War II ended. It is, of course, part of the worldwide communistic plan. Well, I think the likelihood of Soviet bases in the Mediterranean and in Greek ports, uh, the ability of the Soviet Union to project power into uh, North Africa, into the Middle East, uh, would have been stronger, which is one reason I think the United States helped them. In Greece, heavy operations have been carried out against communist rebel strongholds around the Gramus Mountains near the Albanian frontier. Greece is the first case in the Cold War when a small nation is used as a proxy by the two superpowers. It is the first Cold War shooting war. The USA against the USSR. Capitalism against communism. During the Civil War, you were on the right side or the left side? People who were on the left side, they went up to the mountains to hide and fight. I was born in Sparta, 1938. We lived in fear. My father kept his position neutral. He didn't want to be involved with any other parties. Civil war is a very sad thing. And actually, it's a dangerous thing because uh, you fight for an idea. You don't fight for your whole country. It was brother against brother. The pictures that follow illustrate his complaint of what is going on in Western Macedonia. Refugees moving away from the mountainous districts where the rebels are said to be operating from well-established camps and Greek regulars on their way to engage and round up the gangs described as bandits. On February the 10th, some 600 Greek rebels attacked in the direction of Salonika. They were defeated by regular troops. Half of them were killed and about 120 were taken prisoner. We used to walk to school. A police station was very close by our school. And as we really reached uh, the gate, I turned around and to my horror, there were heads outside the police station. Quite a few heads, just the heads outside. And there's scary faces. And I was too scared to turn around and look again. It was just the heads. What they used to do, they used to do that to tell people, well, if you go with the left side, that's what's going to happen to you. A number of women were among those captured, none of whom seemed to be in very good shape nor to have anything much in the way of equipment. After being rounded up, they were marched through the streets of Salonika, escorted by government soldiers and followed by large and excited crowds of civilians. One day, there was a lot of noise. A truck just stopped outside the house. And I was curious, I wanted to see. So I went outside, and what I remember is that beautiful hair, that beautiful hair that it was just flowing from the back of the truck. There were about three bodies there. I didn't know there were bodies then. 
So this woman probably went to the mountains to help maybe their relatives, maybe their loved ones, and they caught them and they killed them. Because the other countries interfere, it creates a chaotic situation and it lasted for some time. It lasted for longer than it should have been and uh, it's unfair. After four years, the communists are defeated. The Greeks uh, probably would not have been able to win the Civil War in 1947 by themselves. The West has prevented Stalin from gaining another toehold in Europe. The two and a half thousand year old Acropolis stands witness to the end of another war in its long history. The sailors lost no time in visiting the Acropolis, where they were entertained to a display of dancing by the Greek army. Watching this, it's hard to realize that the F-Zones are among the toughest fighters in the world. But the real fun came when the American visitors were asked to join in. Obviously, this Greek version of the Palais Glide was a bit complicated for mere jitterbug fans to master all at once. Communist forces attempt a similar outcome on the other side of the world. I wish to express my appreciation for the interest and sympathy shown to my country, China, by our American friends. The United States uh, faced a very difficult decision in trying to uh, keep China from being communist. There had been a civil war going on between the forces of the communists, Mao Zedong, and the nationalist leader, Chiang Kai-shek. Life for ordinary people in China is brutal and primitive. It's not hard for the communists to gain followers in their fight against the government. and manpower alone hauls the boats upstream and over the rapids with cheerleaders to encourage the men. The communists in Russia and in China both were able to uh, hypnotize and to propagandize and to convince, persuade the peasants in their countries, the poor people, that they had been taken advantage of, that the rich people had all the money, all the counts and the princes and the, and the upper level people were corrupt. As far as the peasants were concerned, if the communists took over and shot everybody that, that, that had money, uh, you know, at that point they were so beaten down and brutalized and had nothing to look forward to that they figured, well, you know, why not give that a try? The USA is determined to prevent a communist China and aid the armies of Chiang Kai-shek. The battle for the city of Suchow is joined. Less than 180 miles from the capital, Nanking, nationalist forces dig in for a losing fight. The 400,000 nationalists are armed largely with American weapons, and 105 millimeter guns open a barrage. Just as in Greece, the war in China is a superpower struggle. The USA supports the nationalist anti-communist government, and the USSR supports the communists. The siege of the town lasted for some time, and rice had to be brought in by air. Planes rushed up supplies for the defenders of the city and flew out the wounded, though latest reports tell of 20,000 casualties eventually abandoned in the retreat. The military situation, from the nationalist point of view, is very grave. They claim that the communists are kept supplied by the USSR, saying that the Chinese Reds captured in the battle were armed with modern military equipment from Russia. Today, communism has swept like a red tide over this ancient civilization, from the old capital of Peking down to the Yangtze and Nanking. I was born in China, in Shanghai, actually. 
Western democratic sort of system couldn't work in China. We look at the history, you know. On the 1st of October, 1949, Mao Zedong proclaims the People's Republic of China. There probably are some that would make the argument that China is better for having communism than if it had had a corrupt democracy. That's arguable. Uh, I, I would have preferred a, a corrupt democracy that, that we tried to help become less corrupt. Those years, my time in China, when the Mao Zedong was ruling, of course, it's a dictatorship, right? You could have said nothing apart from uh, long live uh, Chairman Mao or, uh, you know, uh, love uh, China or love Communist Party, you know, all the songs, the music, and everything, the school books, everything was like that. But it was a simple life. The relationship between people were warmer, and uh, the moral sense was better. While the map turns red in the east, the Soviets make another move, right in the heart of Europe. Post-World War II Germany is now two very different states. Berlin, the old capital, is isolated in Russian-occupied East Germany. Just like Germany itself, the city is divided into East and West zones. After the destruction of Berlin and the end of World War II, it was agreed between the victorious powers that the German capital should be divided into zones for the purpose of occupation by Britain, America, France and Russia. To supply Berlin, there were three land corridors where, which were guaranteed by treaty, and a rail corridor between Magdeburg and Berlin. But Berlin was 110 miles inside of the Russian sector of East Germany. They wanted us out of the city. 1948, and the city is about to be held ransom. West Germany is part of the Western European economy. The Allies launch a new currency, cementing West Germany's emergence as an independent state. Stalin retaliates. He orders his troops to seal off roads to the German capital. The Berlin blockade begins. I was stationed in Germany when the Berlin airlift started. This was an attempt by the Russians to get us out of Berlin. Marshal Sokolovsky's shutdown of all service transport between the sectors brought Berlin's railways to a stop. And that was one way they applied pressure, where they blocked off all entrances, rail, air, and autobahn. The famous autobahns were deserted, and even canal traffic was at a standstill. Soviet brutality has been clearly demonstrated across Eastern Europe. Many fear for the lives of West Berliners. There was only one way open to the beleaguered capital, by air. And at Western Zone airfields, supplies were loaded aboard transports which had been rushed to the scene. The US government decided we will keep them, millions of people supplied by air. And the airlift started. Aircraft had limited carrying capacity in those days and very slow. It started off with the aircraft taking coal, other fuel, food, medical supplies, clothing, whatever, up to sustain the Berliners. After a very short time, it was realized that this just wasn't sufficient. As winter approaches, something needs to happen fast. The British and American Air Forces come up with a plan. In order to increase the number of sorties, they had a system where the aircraft would take off from West Germany, fly up the corridor, and land, offload the fuel, and take off straight away. They had enough fuel to get back. The flight of over 150 miles over Russian territory was accomplished by relays of British and American aircraft which landed at about three minute intervals throughout the night and day. It's 
been estimated that 24 hours of the airlift is equivalent in organization and effort to launching a thousand bomber ray. There were many, probably hundreds of lives lost, British and American mainly, uh, just through crashes or bad weather or running out of fuel or whatever. So it was costly. America and Britain prepare for the worst. Here's the first of the superforts coming into land at Scampton, Lincolnshire. Altogether, two B-29 groups comprising 60 superforts were on their way, each aircraft carrying regular and spare crews. In addition, one of them brought a Pomeranian, a mask it may be, or a watchdog. A B-29 dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The B-29 squadron sent to Britain are within range of Moscow. Asked about the object of their visit, Colonel John Henry, the group commander, said this. The purpose of our visit is a long-range training flight. We don't know exactly how long we'll be here. We'll be here for a short period of temporary duty. The threat to the Soviet Union is clear. We have a right to be in Berlin, and we intend to maintain that right. We have, of course, a situation in Berlin which may at any time precipitate a hideous world struggle. It had the possibility of uh, escalating and spinning out of control. It could be a limited confrontation, or it could be all-out war. The world holds its breath. Will the Americans use their superweapon? The Security Council of the United Nations is now facing its greatest test, the question of the Berlin dispute between Russia and the Western powers. In East Berlin, the communist organized demonstrations against being threatened by the bomb. With a never-ending display of force, German communists parade through Potsdamer Platz carrying banners which sing the hymn of hate against the Western powers with particular attention to the United States. With the battered Reichstag as a backdrop, Berlin citizens again gather more than 200,000 strong to hear reassurances that Berlin will be held at all costs. West Berliners need supplies airlifted from the West to survive. They plan to double the capacity of the Gatau City Airport. Berlin itself, as everyone knows, is in ruins, but an excellent use has recently been made of some of the great masses of rubble contained in the city. German men and women have been working away loading the stuff into lorries for transport to Gatau Airfield, where the making of a new runway has been a priority job. First Dakota to take off from the new runway marked a real triumph. The Americans saw that the children had nothing to do with the war, and a lot of their aircraft coming in had sweets and candies and stuff in the cockpit. And as they approached to land, they threw, that, threw these out of the aircraft, and there'd be hungry German children underneath gathering them up. Then, with no warning, on the 12th of May, 1949, the Berlin blockade ends. The hottest spot in the Cold War is eliminated, at least temporarily, as the blockade is lifted by the Russians. Allied vehicles await the removal of the barriers and the signal for the dash to Berlin. Stalin realized that, you know, the West was not going to give in, and it all just stopped overnight. With the opening of the gates, a new chapter in post-war history begins to unroll down German highway.
food and other supplies again flow freely into the city. The airlift has kept three million people alive. No bombs were dropped. The first major European Cold War crisis is over. But it is just the beginning. For the next 40 years, the world will live in constant fear of annihilation.